Hi guys, um, so I've just done a, a talk at the Kettering Vegan Fair and I thought I'd record a very quick video of um, somebody who has attended my talk a few times now and um, I've gotten to know him and I really want to share with you something that he has experienced for um, well a number of years, I'll let him tell you that. I have Brian here with me. Brian is actually an ex-dairy farmer and um, it's been really important for me to meet somebody like Brian to actually verify what, uh, what I'm saying and to actually find out whether what I'm talking about is nonsense and just information I've picked up from the internet or does this stuff actually happen. And for those of you that perhaps haven't come to any of my talks where I debunk common myths that vegetarians have about the realities of the egg and dairy industry, we're talking about things like artificial insemination, we're talking about separation of calf and cow, we're talking about dehorning and debudding cows. And I have today Brian with me, and I want Brian to share with you exactly what actually um, goes on in these industries. So hi Brian. Hello. Um, so you're an ex-dairy farmer. Oh, yeah. um, do you want to just share briefly oh, yeah. with the people who are going to be watching this exactly what goes on yeah. um, in on a dairy farm? Yes, indeed. Um, it's not quite what we've been led to believe the reality. So it's a fairly brutal process. From start to finish, uh, the, the calf's taken away from the, the cow after about four days. His first feed is from a bottle. But if you've got a couple of hundred, maybe a thousand cattle on a farm, you can't bottle feed each one. So their ration goes into a trough, and then they're dried up onto solid meal as quickly as possible. Uh, the whole process for the calves, generally they're, they're shedded over their first winter. The bedding goes in, and the muck goes onto the bedding, more bedding's added, and so on and so on. So end of the winter, springtime, when they're turned out onto pasture, the muck's probably two to three feet deep in the shed, and we have to fall pull that out and get it onto the stack. The, uh, the whole process for the, for the cow, after it's, it's dried off for a month or two between lactations, to give it a rest, then it's back into the process again. They're prone to mastitis because of this relentless pressure that the body's under. Uh, it's a simple balancing act of economics of protein in versus milk out, money in versus money out, and a cow getting mastitis is pretty much a death sentence. It may last six to eight years if, if they're doing okay, um, but ultimately it's all down to profitability and the industry itself has changed so much in the last few years. The national head count of cattle has remained the same even though the, about 50% of dairy farms are closed. They're getting bigger and bigger with, with fewer and fewer farms and more and more cattle and it's become a mass industrialised process and there is no real sense of us ever been involved in this anymore because it's not sustainable and it's not ethical. We've now got raw milk and travelling 150, 200 miles for processing. Come back as a finished product, another couple of hundred miles. So your supposed fresh milk on your your shop shelf is probably three to four, maybe five days old by the time it gets to you. So it isn't quite what it's made out to be. The adverts don't give you the true picture. And Brian, um, have you ever had any experiences of actually debudding a calf, uh, which is basically the removal of the the horn of a, of, a, of a calf with a hot iron rod. Yeah. Something I read about yeah. regularly, something that I have spoken yeah. to people about, but have you ever actually had physical, actual experience yes. with it? Yes, we have done. I mean, the, the, especially bull calves that can get rid of beef. The process is they'll be, they'll be debodied first to get rid of the, the horns, playing like a hot soldering iron into the, into the top of the skull to, to effectively kill the horn from growing. Are they given any anaesthesia no, for this? Nothing, painkillers? Nothing, no. Then the next part of the process, they've got to be neutered, so that's effectively a pair of pliers or a, a, a clamp on top of the scrotum. Again, no anaesthetic. And then, if you see a cow or a, a bull with a horn, with a, a ring through the nose, that's effectively a hole, like a leather hole punch through the septum. Again, no anaesthetic. And that's a pretty rough day for a bull calf. But it can get all that done in one go. So you've got a, you've got a calf that's been in severe distress, no anaesthetic, barely able to stand, and it's effectively turned into a shed and left. And so this calf has not only been separated from the mother that gave birth to him, but not only does it have a ring punctured through the septum of his nose, but also has his testicles removed without anaesthesia, the ring put in with that painkiller, as well as being dehorned with a hot iron rod. What's the reason for this? Because I've read, and tell me if this is correct or not, I've read that they actually 
need less space when they don't have horns, so feeding them is easier, but also the beef cow will put on more weight and therefore is more profitable for the farmer yeah. if they remove. Is that true? There's two aspects. One is the aspect of welfare. If you've got animals in close proximity with horns, there's a high likelihood of injury. Okay. But also, the old story goes there's a lot of on eyed cowmen because cow will naturally throw their head around, buck up and whatever, and if you're putting feed into a trough and they rear up, the chances are, I've had a, a, a horn um, on my cheekbone. I was lucky, they get blinded. So it, there is a, a degree of self-preservation, but again, it's just a means to an end. Okay? Brian, thank you so much. I mean, you know, that's the reality of the dairy industry. You've not just heard it from me. I just talk about it when I do these talks. I'm not a farmer. I'm not certainly not an ex dairy farmer, thankfully, but you've now heard it from an ex dairy farmer. Brian, very quickly before we uh, before we close, are you drinking milk now? Nope. Do nope. you eat beef? No. Nope. And would you ever be able to do that now after nope. having experienced everything nope. you did? No. Nope. And the most important thing that I can say with this is that just for the sustainability of, of humanity on the planet, the vegan and uh, plant-based diet is the only way forward, but make the change one meal at a time. And get yourself going the right way for the survival of all of us. Okay, guys, thank you for watching. I mean, I know Brian has advocated the reductitarian approach. I, of course, don't, for those that know me. I don't... I don't um, advocate the reductitarian approach. I, I advocate the abolitionist approach, if I've said that right. Um, it's a mindset. Being vegan is extremely easy in this day and age. You do not need to consume dairy. You do not need to consume the flesh of another animal. There is an abundance of vegan food out there. There are so many vegan fairs happening all over the country. And if you can't make it to a vegan fair, go to a local supermarket and you'll see a whole aisle dedicated to plant-based foods. It's healthy, it's friendlier for the environment, and for goodness sake, it is so much better for the animals. Don't let your taste buds dictate their suffering. Thank you for watching. Follow me on Facebook. It's Imperfectly Vegan. It's I-M-P-E-R-F-E-C-T-L-Y. Vegan is V-G-A-N, so it's Imperfectly Vegan. Um, I'm on YouTube as well, so follow me, subscribe to my channel, and I'll see you next time. Thank you.